Hi, everyone. This is Jackie Cooper with Crypto Mom 2 Talk Show and the Blockchain Legal Institute. I'd like to thank you for hopping on and to remind everyone to definitely like and subscribe. I know that um, we have many conversations in the queue, and so I want to make sure that everyone knows uh, the next wonderful speaker that will be happening when you get that bell, like you just heard, because someone has just um, clicked onto YouTube. So thank you so much for doing that. Definitely. Um, today, I have a special guest on. Actually, um, Adam Miller has um, been a speaker as well as a mentor to me about the DAO community, and he is definitely a thought leader um, in this uh, community. So we're going to be talking about DAOs. We're going to be talking about the legal issues surrounding them. We're going to be talking about jurisdictions in which um, are very DAO friendly and those that might not be. And again, you know, there are many conversations that we're going to be having but before I um, go over to Adam and, and have him share a little bit more about himself and his personal story, for those that are new to um, Crypto Mom 2 or the Blockchain Legal Institute, I just want to share a little background with you. Um, my background is that I am an attorney and I'm also an educator and I'm also an author of the Bitcoin Cinderella series. And I believe that everyone... Um, needs to become more aware of what's going on within the blockchain community because just like the internet was new many years ago the blockchain community is actually developing at such a rapid rate that um, a lot of the technology is going to be embedded within and you won't even know that you're actually using blockchain but i think it's important for everyone who's a consumer or within business to educate yourself so you can be um savvy to what you want to incorporate within your personal life, your financial life, as well as what you want to incorporate within your business. And the reason why I say that is um, blockchain includes both business use cases as well as cryptocurrency. So again, um, because this is a recording, nothing that we share here is financial advice, legal advice, or investment advice. Everyone needs to do their own research and decide what is best for you in your own personal life. But we are providing resources and I I know definitely stay on to the end because Adam has created some remarkable resources for you to share um, with others. And I want to make sure that you enjoy it all. So the Blockchain Legal Institute is a centralized library. And within that library is information about artificial intelligence, Bitcoin, Ethereum, news, events, use cases, you name it. Um, we live in a decentralized world now. And so the library is there for you to save time and to understand what resources are reliable. So that way you can do your own research. It's not exclusive. Uh, it is a lot of it's public, but a lot of it is from private businesses. So we welcome you as a member. And in fact, Adam is one of the members within the Blockchain Legal Institute. And so you'll also find him and the information that he's sharing about DAOs and the Marshall Islands and other uh, content on a variety of the verticals within. So if you happen to see his name in the business, definitely click in, follow through to his website because he can provide a lot of resources for you. With that, I want to welcome you, Adam, to the Blockchain Legal Institute talk show and Crypto Mom 2. How are you doing today? Great. Thank you for having me. I know that I was doing a lot of talking there, but um, <laughs> you and I have, have had many conversations because, as I said, you're a mentor to me in this legal space dealing with DAOs. When I first started, I had no clue what a DAO was. So why don't we start with the basic information as to because there might be listeners who are just starting their journey. What is a DAO? A, what does it even mean? So what it stands for, which makes it sound even more confusing, is Decentralized Autonomous Organization. Mm -hmm. What it is, is any organization, it could be charitable, could be for-profit, could be a community, an investment club, any kind of organization that uses the blockchain for one or more of membership tracking, governance, like voting, and treasury management. Right. So where a traditional organization keeps track of their members on paper, maybe in a PDF, a DAO uses a blockchain, usually a token, where a traditional organization does their voting in meetings or on paper, 
or by email, DAOs do their voting uh, on the blockchain. And same thing with treasury management, where a traditional organization manages their money uh, through a bank account with a CFO and maybe another uh, signatory on the account. A DAO governs their money, controls their money generally on the blockchain. So you've you've actually uh, kind of expanded the need for more definition. So we're going to, for those that um, know me, I love breaking things apart because when I first started seven years ago, I knew absolutely nothing about wallets or about cryptocurrency or about Bitcoin. Now I'm a miner and a whole slew of other things. So um, treasury and wallets, tokens, there's that's a lot of a lot of terminology there. Now I know tokens might be a little bit more complicated, but um, let's actually start from the beginning. So if someone was interested, we're going to approach this from two sides. There is the creation of a DAO, but then there's the participation in a DAO. So we're going to talk right now about the participation in a DAO. Let's say that I discover a DAO that has a um, a topic that. I really want to, you know, or a group that I really want to participate in. How do I gain entry into that DAO community? Do I just email someone? Do I, you know, do I go to Discord? How do I, how do I find DAOs? I mean, that's the other thing, but that's a whole nother conversation. So how do I enter this DAO? What do I need to do? So every DAO is different, just like every organization is different, right? If you say, how do you join a company? There's a lot of standard practices, right? But each company is different. Or how do I volunteer with a nonprofit? Each one's different. That said, most DAOs use some kind of token to track their membership, which means if you hold that token, whether it's a, a fungible token like Bitcoin or Ethereum or a non-fungible token NFT, uh, if you hold one of those tokens, you are a member of the DAO. That's the most common model. Now, still, there's the question of how do you get a, one of the tokens? And in some cases, perhaps you have to petition the current members to allow you into the DAO, in which case they would then give you the token. But in a lot of cases, you can buy the token on the open market, which is what makes many DAOs so open. Right? Anyone can become a member. And so a good example, if anyone wants to go to nouns.build, you will see a model of DAOs called the nouns model or the nouns-ish DAOs, and you'll see a lot of them. And the way nouns-ish DAOs work is every day or whatever time period the DAO wants to choose, there's an auction for one membership NFT, which means one person gets to join the DAO every day. And however much demand there is for joining the DAO will determine what the price of that auction is. So I'm part of one nouns DAO called Purple, which is a DAO that supports the Farcaster ecosystem, which is a Web3 social network, like an alternative to Twitter or X. Um, and uh, the Purple DAO NFT goes for about 0.1 to 0.2 ETH. So something like 200 to $400 a day that goes into the treasury and the members get to vote using those NFTs. So it's one NFT, one vote. Some people own more than one. They get to vote on the use of that treasury in the furtherance of the DAO's mission. So let's just step back a second. So you said I might have to purchase it. So that means I will have to have a wallet. I will have to know how to move my fiat or, for example, of today, dollars to buy a coin, whether it's um, or a token, whether it's Bitcoin or Ethereum. Um, so I'm going to have to convert that into my wallet. And then I'm going to have to then know how to move that over to where the DAO is. A lot of complicated steps if you're new to the this area, but but manageable because there are people that can, you know, probably give you guidance or there's a lot on YouTube too. You do have to be careful though. Um, so once you're in your DAO and you're participating, um, how you said that you know, in a traditional business, you take notes. So how are these records kept? Uh, who holds these records? Are there officers within the DAO or is it just like a kind of, I don't want to say free for all, but, you know, an open co-op or how does it work? Most DAOs do not have a formal management team of any kind. Okay. Uh, the what's cool about DAOs, so we talked earlier about what is a DAO, but why do people care about doing these things on the blockchain instead of on paper? 
And one of the reasons for that is it allows you to have uh, voting and governance at a scale that was cost prohibitive before. So for example, if you think about a public company, forget DAOs for a second, normal public company that has maybe 100,000 shareholders, it literally costs them millions of dollars to hold a vote because they have to mail all of their shareholders documents. They have to email, they have to follow up, they have to have the vote audited, right? So about once a year, they have a vote of the shareholders. If that company instead did all of their membership tracking and their governance on the blockchain, they could hold a vote for $100, right? And so with, with DAOs, rather than receiving a, a mail-in ballot or a digital proxy ballot once a year, any DAO member can usually go to the DAO's website because we interact with the blockchain through websites and submit a proposal. And that proposal could have plain English in it. Like I propose that we go build this new product or I propose that this person gets promoted to H, you know, head of HRs. You can have teams within DAOs and most do. It's not like you can't have any structure. You actually often need more structure because no one's in charge. Um, and that proposal goes on the blockchain and then everyone else who is a member can go and submit their vote on the blockchain and the blockchain and the smart contracts that run on the blockchain count the votes. And if there's any change of uh, exchange of money related to the proposal, like for example, let's say the proposal is to hire Jackie as a head of HR and pay you $10,000 for your first month of work. Then when that proposal passes, the smart contract will automatically send you the $10,000. And that's part of why DAOs are called autonomous. The A of DAO is because when you vote to make something happen, oftentimes that action is taken autonomously rather than needing to wait for someone else in the DAO to actually write you a check for $10,000 and make a, a, doc, a contract saying that now you're the head of HR, right? Instead, as soon as that proposal passes, it's that is valid and the money gets sent. So... Um... When I first started, you know, my hat is as a lawyer, but again, just because you're a lawyer doesn't mean you know everything. Um, I kept thinking, smart contract, what is that? Is that something that I write? So why don't you explain to people who hear contract and smart contract, what is it? Because the idea that you can embed some information within the um, the computer, the, the DAO to make something happen is remarkable. But who actually does that writing? How does that actually work? So smart contracts is an interesting term because uh, what they do allow you to do, and, and I'll say how, is to automate things that you used to have to do manually through legal documents, yeah. such as, let's say, escrow is the simplest example, right? I have an NFT, you have one Ethereum, and you want to trade me the Ethereum for the NFT, we can write a smart contract or use one of the already written open source smart contracts that's written such that as long as we both put our asset in, then it recognizes that and gives the asset to the other person. But unless we both put our assets in, whoever, if one person does, they get their asset back, right? And so now we've automated escrow in such a way that we don't necessarily need a separate document, a legal document, or certainly not an escrow firm, which probably would have cost 5% of the transaction uh, value. Um, so, but that's code. So that's written by developers, engineers. Um, and I will say that often people make the mistake. There, there's a, a kind of famous phrase in the world of blockchain, code is law. Now, just because you've taken what used to be in a regular contract written in English and written it in code instead, actually doesn't mean that code is law. It just means that code is going to be automatically executed on the blockchain. But still, there's a legal framework around what does it mean to own something? Are there taxes that, that will come due? What happens if I sent you, what if I fake, it turns out it was a fake NFT and I told you it was the real one, but it wasn't. Well, you're still going to have to take me to court in a human court, right? And we're going to have to follow the laws of whatever jurisdiction we're in or that, that are governing our deal, right? When it comes to a commercial transaction where there has potentially been fraud. So just because you put some stuff in code doesn't mean it replaces all of the important law or any other agreements we may have had between ourselves written in English, but you can take some of what used to have to be done in contracts and with intermediaries and automate it by writing code. 
So my the question that comes to mind is, um, because again, if you are the CEO of a company, you might not know everything, but you do have to be able to oversee things. If you're not familiar with how coding happens, how do you know that the person that you've hired is doing exactly what you need it to do? And also, what about the security within that code? So it, you know, it, you know, there might be other issues involved. At least with paper, you can read it, given given that you understand the language that the paper is written on. Um, and you can say, okay, this doesn't make sense. Let's change this. How do you do that when it's a smart contract code? Yeah, and to be fair, I would say most people probably would say that legal contracts are hard to read and hard to understand. And especially in, when it comes to complex transactions, no one would try to understand or enter into a contract without lawyers involved, right? So the challenge is not unique to smart contracts, but to your point, if the smart contract is written in code, you need a computer scientist or some kind of engineer or developer to look at it to tell you that it really does what it says it does. Now, it's not like every time people use a smart contract, they actually hire a developer to look at the code or look at the code themselves. Instead, what happens is because all of this code is open source and available for anyone to see on the blockchain, and you can see everyone who's used it in every way it's been used, you can validate that, okay, this is the smart contract that has been used a million times in the past year. And you can go on Twitter or X and see that uh, everyone who's used it has tweeted positive things about it. And you can ask your friend, uh, Jackie, who's been in blockchain longer than you have, hey, have you heard of Uniswap? Is that a trustworthy system for transacting in fungible tokens? And she'll tell you, yes, Uniswap's been around since the beginning. You can trust it. So there is this social layer. And some people call it layer zero because uh, most blockchains are called layer one blockchains. But layer zero is the social layer. And you absolutely still need that social layer of uh, people uh, having social connections and cultural knowledge and shared knowledge about which smart contracts you can trust and what organizations who write smart contracts you can trust. And that's just as important as trusting the social layer of people who have all agreed to the terms of use of Facebook before then maybe it's a bad example because the terms of use tends to be kind of uh, uh, something that we all uh, dislike these days because we don't read it and we agree to it. I was it, about to say that least... we would click yes on it. <laughs> <laughs> but but you're right. And so, but that's how it's similar to traditional contracts, right? We There's a social layer where we all kind of know that it's probably okay to check the box with Facebook, but not some random website you just visited that you've never heard of before and no one's ever heard of before. Don't yeah. check that box, right? The same thing goes for, for blockchain. So we've uh, obviously this area is a little bit complicated as uh, definitely involves you know people uh feeling comfortable with navigating it let's hop over to the creation side of a DAO. so you know people like to go in and be part of things but you sometimes get the idea oh, let me create one and i know i've thought about that for blockchain legal institute and you know again the idea of creating something in the past um it probably was very free flow. Now, I think that there's um, a lot of jurisdictions that are looking at how to regulate the the structure, the governance, and there probably are reasons why. Um, I know that your company, and also for everyone who's listening, either on the audio or on the visual side, um, Adam's contact information will be embedded below, as well as all the resources that uh, we're going to be talking about. But um, there are certain areas like the Marshall Islands or certain states in the United States that are more DAO friendly or trying to develop um, communities uh, so you can incorporate or you can do something with a more legal structure. Do you want to explain why that's happened? And I know you and I were talking off camera about how the Marshall Islands actually has three different laws dealing with this area. So why don't you share a little bit more about why this was needed? Yeah, so it all goes back to a few years ago. I was consulting for a friend of mine's DAO, and we were offered a million dollar grant from the Moonbeam ecosystem to develop software in their ecosystem. And of course, we said, yes, we'd love the grant, but they told us, you know what, actually, we can't give it to you unless you have a legal entity, some kind of incorporated legal form, like a corporation or an LLC. 
Now, every regular startup company in what, like what we call like to call Web two before blockchain, every startup company, every entrepreneur knows that one of the first things you do is you go and you form some kind of corporate entity, right? an LLC, corporation, whatever, a nonprofit, etc. Um, but in the space of DAOs, we kind of forgot about that because it was a different environment. We just didn't realize that we were going to run into the same issues. Um, but this was you know, a real light bulb moment where we said, oh, if we're going to transact with other businesses, we have to have a legal entity. And so we looked around the world and we looked at a corporation in Delaware. We looked at a foundation in Switzerland. We looked at a foundation in the Cayman Islands. We looked all over the world. And it turned out that virtually every law related to corporate entities had been written in such a way that DAOs would not be able to incorporate in that jurisdiction. And what I mean by that is that virtually every corporate entity type in the world requires you requires a company to keep the full names and physical addresses of all of their members. Well, DAOs almost never do that, right? DAOs want you to be able to just buy a token and now you're a member. Similarly, virtually every corporate law in the world requires a company to have some kind of management team, trustees, officers, directors, managing members, whatever it is. Most DAOs, virtually all DAOs do not have a management team and they don't want a board. They don't want a small group of people who's in charge in any way and, and has to take action on behalf of the organization. So there were other issues too. Uh, but we reached out to a friend of ours, a senator in the Marshall Islands, which is a sovereign nation in the South Pacific that has been a leading jurisdiction for the shipping industry for several decades. And we said, hey, DAOs are a little bit like ships, right? They kind of live everywhere and nowhere at the same time. And so uh, we thought the Marshall Islands would be a good place to approach legislation for DAOs. And our sen senator said, yes, let's do it. Over the past few years, we've written and and asked uh, three laws that have created a what's called a DAO LLC. It's a kind of a fork of a normal LLC that changes the requirements so that while not getting in the way of anti-money laundering and combating of terrorism around the world, we can still allow DAOs to truly be DAOs while forming a legal entity that's recognized all over the world, allows the DAO to transact in the traditional economy, open a bank account if they want to, sign contracts, protect their members from unlimited liability, pay their own taxes so that the members don't have to pay taxes. All these things that uh, you know we traditionally get from corporate forms, now DAOs can get those things too through MyDAO, which stands for Marshall Islands DAO and is the public-private partnership that allows DAOs or Web3 projects in general to form DAO LLCs in the Marshall Islands. So I'm I'm looking at our our time out of respect for you because you said you did have a um, a stop time. Um, why don't you go ahead and share the um, the cover of the resource that everyone can download for free? Um, because again, um, this is a guide to DAO incorporation and. Um, Everyone who is listening or, you know, on the Zoom, definitely reach out to Adam so that way he can explain a little bit more. But this is definitely free to download at his website, but it's also will be within the Blockchain Legal Institute as well. Um, now, I know that you are also talking about other projects that you um, are gathering information. Do you want to kind of share more about what you're doing so that way people can reach out to you as well? Sure. So the other thing is that we found that almost all of the uh, Web3 projects that reach out to us uh, are in need of a uh, Web3 lawyer, yeah. right? And especially in a lot of cases, a DAO lawyer. So another thing we've done is we've built a database of DAO lawyers and Web3 lawyers from all over the world. Uh, what's their specialty? What's their experience? And we can just get you connected with them. So whether you're interested in the Marshall Islands or not, whether you're looking to incorporate a DAO or not, I'm happy to get people connected with lawyers from our partner network. There's no cost. Most of these lawyers are happy to have a free consultation with you as well. Um, so anyone who's looking for blockchain, Web3 related legal advice, I mean, obviously BLI is an amazing uh, resource there already, but I'm also happy to get people connected with uh, lawyers or tax advisors and other professionals that are in our network. Yeah. So just to clarify, Blockchain Legal Institute is a, a resource base, but we um, we might have lawyers who are members. But again, definitely reach out to Adam because uh, we don't do legal advice, but we are um, legal resources and content resources. So I appreciate that. Um, 
any last minute thoughts that you want to share? Um, you, there's, I know we're going to have more than one conversation because this is a conversation that just keeps evolving within the community. Um, I know that you and I've talked about that DAOs need to think about having lawyers now. That's one of the yeah. things that they um, th needs, needs to happen. Do you want to explain why and any other last minute thoughts? Yeah, I mean, let, there's all kinds of legal and regulatory issues that apply to DAOs, uh, even though they're so new. And we haven't heard about a lot of DAOs getting in trouble yet, although some have, because the government has hardly realized that DAOs exist. But the fact is that as soon as they do, and as soon as more and more DAOs succeed financially, the government will be coming after us. And so you do need to do the same type of legal and regulatory work in DAOs as you would with traditional organizations. And usually the first thing that any traditional organization does is form its legal entity. Right. And so my number one piece of advice is that if you're in Web3, if you're in blockchain and you're you're starting or joining an organization, it's just as important to think about incorporating that organization in some way as it is for traditional companies. And so that's something you need to look at early on in the development of any DAO. I agree. And I also want to say that in addition to the lawyers that you definitely need to have on your team, you need to also educate your accountants because they are helping you do your taxes. And this is an important part of any successful business. So yep. Adam, thank you so much for being on. We really appreciate you. I look forward to our next conversation. Everyone who um, is on, remember what I always say, be kind to yourself, be kind to others. We're so interconnected. We're all part of one world and everyone have a great day. Thanks. Thanks, Jackie.